Does everyone know how to change? We still have a minute or so. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's press conference of the American Astronomical Society. This morning's topic is black holes and binary stars. Before we get to that, I would like to make the usual movie announcement. If you have anything in your possession that makes noise, please turn it off so that we don't get interrupted in the middle of important findings. I would like to remind the speakers uh, to please always speak into the, uh, into the microphone because we have folks who are attending virtually on the web and otherwise they can hear you. Same thing later on when we have questions and answers. Anyone asking questions, anyone answering questions, please always use the microphone. So this morning's topic, as I said, is black holes and binary stars. We will start off with George Jargovsky from Caltech talking about the periodic variability in a quasar, the closest binary supermassive black hole. Uh, next, Daniel Stern from Jet Propulsion Laboratory will ask the question, will the real monster black hole please stand up? We'll find out. Uh, and Daniel, by the way, is a last minute replacement for a colleague who unfortunately got sick. Uh, next, Yuri van Leeuwen will talk about the disappearance of a cosmic spinning top. And finally, Bianca Danilet from Ohio State University will talk about the all-sky all automated survey for supernovae, big science with small telescopes. And with that, I'm turning it over to George. Thank you very much. Let's see if this actually works. So I guess my talk combines both of the subjects, black holes and binaries. Um, so I'd like to tell you about the uh, result we just published in Nature, it appeared yesterday. There is also a free copy available in archive, as listed here. These are my collaborators, including Dan Stern here, he gets the double dip today. And just to quickly go through some background to put you in the mood, as you all probably know, quasars, we believe, are powered by accretion of material on supermassive black holes. And as the stuff rains down, it's somewhat ra random process. So they do vary in luminosity as that happens and vary in a fairly random fashion, which we understand reasonably well in terms of statistical description. So that's fairly common. Now we know also that galaxies evolve a lot through merging. And when galaxies merge, eventually they're supermassive black holes, which are, we know, common in all big galaxies, do merge as well. Once that happens at the end, supposedly a huge burst of gravitational waves, uh, which are, we are yet to detect, but we're pretty sure will happen. And that will release the amount of energy that's comparable to something like 10 billion supernovae. So those will be very spectacular fireworks, but only in gravitational waves. Well, we don't know how much optical. So that's the background of the science. We expect that binary supermassive black holes will form as a natural part of galaxy and supermassive black hole evolution. And we've seen plenty of them with separations ranging from kiloparsecs to hundreds of kiloparsecs, but that's much too far to be close to this final event. The data we use are from a survey we call Catalina Real-Time Transient Survey. We are piggybacking on a search for killer asteroids from University of Arizona. And essentially, we monitor a brightness of about 500 million objects in the sky, about 80% of the sky, with data of about up to nine years. 
uh, I think we'll hear about another similar survey later. Now, this is so far a completely unprecedented amount of data to study any variable phenomenon in the sky by orders of magnitude. And we, from the very beginning, we made this data freely available to anyone in the community to use for their own research. So what we've done is we took light curves, flux histories, of a quarter of a million known quasars for which spectra exist. We know they're quasars. And we run a bunch of algorithms on them, and one of them we did almost for fun is to look for a periodic behavior. Quasars are supposed to vary randomly, not periodically. And out of a quarter of a million, we found 20 that seem to vary periodically. And when we did very extensive simulations with the right kind of noise properties, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we expect there will be one found by chance, given our criteria. But we find 20. So that gave us some confidence. Now, the very best one of those is this one. It's called PG-1302-102, romantic name. It was called so by Richard Green and Martin Schmidt a long time ago. And we had a data that covered about nine years. We saw this was interesting. So we pulled data from another survey called Linear that extended coverage somewhat. And those fell right on the curve. And then we dug it through literature and found more data, and now we have about 20 years of coverage with some noise at older data. It all fits very nicely. The period of this variation is four years at the quasar. It's about five and a bit here for us. The second piece of information is the spectra of quasars, which is pretty standard looking. Well, this one has broad emission lines that are a little asymmetric. And one of our collaborators, Elad Glickman, has fit these by adding a second component, second set of lines that are slightly shifted in velocity, which is what you normally would see, say, in binary stellar systems and so on. So that gives us an additional confidence that what we're seeing likely is a binary. So that is our interpretation, that we are seeing a very close supermassive black hole binary with separations of uh, less than 10 milliparsecs, or about 2,000 uh, astronomical units, so roughly size of the outer solar system. And this is about six orders of magnitude smaller than binary quasars that we've seen so far. Now, there is still plenty of time to merge. It's about less than a million years, maybe closer to 100,000. The theoretical models are not yet good enough to tell, and nor do we know enough about geometry of the system. And the idea here is that you do have two black holes. They do not be equal. Maybe one is 10 times bigger than the other. They orbit around. Um, there is an accretion disk, which they share. Uh, brightness can be modulated by one hole passing through a disk or by tidally distorting it or warping it. Or if there's a jet emerging, then that jet will be processing like Earth's axis processes. So we do not know the exact mechanism by which brightness variations occur, not yet anyway. But anything that we can possibly think of requires presence of a second massive object, like a supermassive black hole. Because we're talking about gravitational field, if you want to perturb process near a supermassive black hole, you really need some comparable mass to do that. Now, this quasar is known to be actually participating in some merging. Uh, these, are, these are Hubble Space Telescope pictures. There are some galaxies near it which may eventually merge. That's not what we're talking about. The merger we're talking about happened a long time ago. We're just seeing final stages of those two black holes spiraling. But, you know, when there is one, there is probably more. And so this is pretty normal for quasars. So the upshot here is what we've done is really a, an example of big data science. We started with a quarter of a million light curves, a couple hundred points each, and we applied new discovery tools. We found 20 interesting objects. There is no way that we could have found this with any smaller data set or less sophisticated tools for that matter. And interestingly enough, this number, 20 out of a quarter million, is more or less exactly what theorists expect for a population of evolving quasars and supermassive black holes in this kind of range of separations, about one in 10,000 quasars to show it. So in the past, people have claimed periodic behavior in some quasars that all of those have gone away, 
And it's the same phenomenon as when people look at stock market and see cycles. Um, but when you have serious amounts of data and the right tools and do careful modeling and so on, then you can actually separate spurious from real. And I think we've done that. Um, so we will continue to monitor this object and all the others. And my guess is that these time scales are still very long for us so that we will probably learn more by studying a population of these objects rather than, than any individual case. Thank you. Uh, so as uh, Inga mentioned, the main speaker was supposed to be Ann Hornschmeyer for this. At around 1 a.m., she emailed me from her hotel room around the corner. She's curled up with a high fever and when it was unable to do that, this talk. Um, but I'm going to talk about uh, new star images of a nearby emerging galaxy system, ARP-299. This is sort of what Georgia's system might have looked like about 100 million years earlier. So these are two galaxies in the process of merging. Uh, separated by much larger distances than Georgia's system. But this system is also much closer to the Earth and lets us really take beautiful images. And so my main release here is that thanks to the uh, focused high energy images from the Nuclear Spectroscopic Telescope Array satellite, we're really able to see what's going on, which of these black holes in these two merging galaxies is lit up, and um, study this merging galaxy system in, a, in detail. Um, this is reporting results from a paper by Andrew Patak, who, which is on the archive. The paper is accepted to Astro PH, and mainly here we're doing an image release. On the left, we have the new star image of ARP-299. In the uh, kind of extended red light, we have the lower energy X-rays below 10 kiloelectron volts or 10 keV. That emission is kind of diffuse. It's related mainly to star formation. And then the high energies above 10 kiloelectron volts or in the hard X-ray regime, we see this most of that, those, that light's coming from this blue knot a little bit to the right or to the west um, from the western galaxy in the system. And that's coming from accretion onto the black hole. Uh, prior to this image, you knew that there was black holes in these systems. You had hints that you know, one of them or both of them was actively accreting. But thanks to New Star, we see which is a real monster standing up. And we see that's mainly that, that guy on the right. Uh, the image on the right is a Hubble image out of the archive of ARP-299. In the middle, we have the two images uh, superposed. And you see that, that blue New Star light is mainly coming from the, the right nucleus. Um, this system, ARP-299, is about 44 megaparsecs away, so it's relatively close uh, from these sort of rare merging systems. And so a little bit more in detail, here's the close-up of the Hubble image um, showing the two nuclei, which are uh, creatively called ARP-299A on the east and ARP-299B on the right. Um, you know, these two galaxies, which are in the process of colliding, the two nuclei are separated by about 20 arc seconds. It's about the angular diameter of Mars as seen from Earth. Um, physically, it's about four kiloparsecs. And so in comparison, we're about eight kiloparsecs from the center of our galaxy. So these are two galaxies that are really in each other's business. It'd be like there's a whole other galaxy between us and the center of our galaxy. And when this happens, we think these mergers are quite common in the history of the universe. We think it's an important way that galaxies build up. It causes star formation. It causes the black holes to accrete. Um, it has a lot of feedback that affects the later evolution of the galaxies. And so these nearby systems let you study that process in detail. Um, what do we know about ARP-299 prior to the new star image? Here's a lower energy X-ray image taken with the Chandra satellite. On, that's a NASA satellite. ESA's XMM Newton soft X-ray satellite has also taken images of ARP-299. But the lower energy X-rays, what you see is some diffuse emission. You see a lot of point sources. But most of that emission, almost you know, more than 90% of it, is related to star formation processes or um, stellar mass black holes or neutron stars accreting from binary systems. But most of that emission is not related to the supermassive black holes in the hearts of these galaxies. Um, about 15 years ago, Italy's BepoSac satellite imaged the system in the high energy X-rays above 10 keV. But with the technology of BepoSacs, you had a very poor resolution image. You saw that there was a lot of high energy emission coming from the system, but you couldn't tell whether it was from the eastern side, from the western side, if both of them were lit up. To be honest, you didn't know if there was some serendipitous source nearby that was causing the emission. 
With the new star, you have 100 times sharper images, and you're able to really resolve out where the light's coming from. And so here's the new star images at 10 to 20 kiloelectron volts, or even at higher energies, 30 to 40 keV. And you can see that the uh, ARP-299b on the right is 100 times brighter than ARP-299a. Uh, thanks to new star, we not only get this sharp, resolved image and see where the, the accretion is happening in the system that's happening mainly in just one galaxy, uh, but we also get a spectrum of it and can study how much material is in there. The system on the right probably isn't actively accreting at this point over time. Theoretical models predict that you get this sort of flipping on and off, that one is on and then the other one's on. It's material sloshing around as these galaxies collide. Um, there is a possibility, on the other hand, that ARP-299A has a lot of accretion with a lot, lot of material that's hiding it, even with the penetrating um, energies that New Star studies. Paper, here's the, where the paper is accessible. Be showing up in AppJ in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so here's that image uh, one more time. Um, and so thanks to these penetrating x-rays above 10 keV that we see with new star comparable energies at doctors and dentists and airport security see, we were able to see that um, most of that, the accretion of the system is coming from one of the galaxies. And so for more information, you could go to the new star website or see the paper. Good morning, everyone. I'm Yuri van Leeuwen from the uh, Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy, Astron, and University of Amsterdam in Holland. And uh, standing here before you, I feel a little bit like a uh, stellar detective today because I'm presenting the case of the uh, missing pulsar, the missing spinning top. And the case number is J1906, so keep that in mind. We have a few leads on uh, what happened, and they all seem to pinpoint in uh, the same direction, gravity. So it's a bit strange that the debate on a general relativity right now seems to be as hot as it was 100 years ago when uh, uh, Einstein's uh, uh, paper on uh, GR came out. On the small scales, two well-tested theories, uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics, still aren't, we aren't able to combine those. And on the large scales, the effects of, for example, dark matter could also be explained by deviations from uh, general relativity. And I'm sure you are all aware that the expansion of the universe actually first uh, was uh, coined as a term in uh, the Einstein uh, equations. So overall, that gives us a, a little feel of, uh, of, of where to go look for clues for this disappearance of this uh, cosmic spinning top. Um, it continues to be important to study gravity, um, especially on scales where the strong regime uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, where in, especially in the strong regime, and that's something that's very hard to do on Earth or in the solar system, but you can do that really well in radio pulsars. So radio pulsars are neutron stars, extremely dense and compact stars. I guess some of you are aware. They pack more mass than our sun has in a, a sphere that's only 10 miles across. And the densities in these, in these uh, Newton stars are higher than the densities in your atom core, and they haven't been seen in the universe since it was about a millisecond old, so pretty extreme. The pulsar that I'm talking about today, J1906 plus 0746, is a very bright and fast spinning pulsar that we found in the Arecibo sky in 2004. And I remember this night very well. Laura Cajun and I had, uh, had uh, spent a day uh, surveying the sky for, out of Arecibo for the P-alpha survey. And there was a real eureka moment that night when we went through the first batch of uh, reduced data and this extremely bright pulsar showed up, which was strange because that part of the sky has been surveyed lots of times and now suddenly really bright and new uh, uh, appears. Very quickly, we found that it orbits a companion star every four hours so imagine, right, the Earth goes around the sun in a year, but these are two stars of, of solar masses each that go around one another in less than four hours. So an extremely relativistic system, as a matter of fact, the second most relativistic system that we know. The extra bonus was that the source is very young. Radio pulsars live to be 10 million, 20 million years, and you can even recycle them, and then they live to be a billion years. But this source, we've quickly found out, is only 100,000 years old. So in a way, you're finding a unicorn, and then it also turns out to be a baby unicorn. So that was pretty neat. So okay, it, it looked pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. We're going we're gonna to monitor the source for a few years, and we're going to sort it all out. But then the, 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 the plot thickened. Now, you might know pulsars being, as being proverbially stable sources that have pulse profiles. You can see these on the right here, which are like fingerprints. So the graphs on the right are basically the, the lighthouse-style graphs, right? 
And they're supposed to be unchanging, and I can, I, can I can recognize many pulsars just from seeing them, but this one you can see varies. You can see uh, there's a few years of data there. It starts in 1998 from archival data, then from 2005 up until 2010. There's extra, extra components that show up. The thing brightens and weakens. So that's weird that we don't see that happen often. So uh, after ruling out suspect number one, we got to think maybe it's something called geodetic precession. Geodetic precession happens when you have a binary star, for example, and every orbit, the source travels through the curved spacetime of the companion, and there's a, a spin-orbit coupling. Now I see this isn't connecting to a few of you, so I have brought some spacetime. And you can see it's pretty flat. And if it's pretty flat, you can see that the rotation axis after one orbit is the same as it was before. But now I'm going to put in a massive star at the center. Watch out. Oof. There we go. And this is, very, this is very close. This is a pretty good analogy to what happens for real. And you can see that after one orbit, the rotation actual, actually doesn't line up anymore. Of course, this is exaggerated about a million times, but still this could be quite a measurable effect in a system like this. But if you want to know that, you have to get the masses of these two sources. And as you may know, getting masses for stars can be pretty hard because often they float freely through space. So in this case, we have to actually look at the binary pulsar and try to weigh each of these stars by their mutual interactions. So we're going to go back to GR and see what clues GR gives us. Turns out there's three. I'm going to list them on the left. And in the right-hand side, you'll see what the, what the resulting masses are going to be. The first clue is that the orbit of this binary pulsar shrinks. In blue here, I've illustrated the curved spacetime. I'm only showing it for the central source. Of course, the pulsar itself also affects, but I, you'll see that later. I wouldn't worry about that right now. The, the source in front, the one with the beams, is the radio pulsar we see, and its unknown companion is the one in the middle. And we measured quite quickly that the orbit actually decays. These two sources, they emit gravitational waves. The energy from that comes from the, uh, the, the orbit, and so you see an orbital decay. And that gives you a total mass for the system. So in this landscape of the two masses, on the horizontal axis, you see the pulsar mass. It'll, it'll be a little clearer in a few slides. On the uh, vertical axis, the companion mass. We now have a feel for where these two sources live. We're trying to triangulate where the companion and, this, uh, and the pulsar live. The next clue we get is from the gravitational redshift. You can see that the radio emission that is emitted from the radio pulsar, it basically needs to climb out of the gravity well of this total system. And if there's a slightly elliptical orbit, if the pulsar is sometimes closer to the companion, it needs to really work its way out of a much deeper well. And that is something we measure. It's called the uh, relativistic redshift, or the Einstein term. Gamma, and you can see that gamma has a very different, it, it, uh, it has a very different uh, relation to the masses of the two systems. So now it's in the interaction, uh, in the intersection of these two curves that the system can live. So now we're actually trying to, we're now triangulating the, the culprits quite well. And then finally, there's one of the most classic GR tests, that is the advance of periastron. Any elliptical orbit will go, again, through different parts of curved spacetime, and that means that even though a source is uh, in, in a Newtonian gravity, it would always stay on the same ellipse. In GR, it'll actually precess. So the ellipses don't actually line up every next orbit. And this is an extremely strange test. You can see the very thin line there, the line. We have to actually zoom in in the top right, and you can see that this allows us to, to pinpoint the two masses of these sources extremely well. So pretty good work on the localization. We got these two... Uh, we got the, the victim and the potential uh, perpetrator uh, pretty well located in, in the mass-mass diagram. So here we are. The masses are 1.2 solar masses for the pulsar and 1.32 solar masses for the uh, companion. Um, in a way, that's, uh, so the mass for the pulsar is pretty standard. It's not, it's not obese. It's certainly not uh, underfed. And the companion, the companion mass range is uh, uh, interesting. It, you can see, because it looks much like the pulsar mass, it's very very compatible with it being a neutron star, so then we have a double neutron star system. But there are white dwarfs known that have similar masses. And because the system is so far away, we cannot determine from the optical whether or not it's a white dwarf. So overall, we conclude that it is, based on these masses, a double neutron star system, but we cannot completely rule out that the companion is actually a white dwarf. Anyway, it's neat because there's only a handful of double neutron star systems from which masses are known, and this adds to that. So with that, we, I think we have uh, all the clues that we need to see if these masses and these, this GR interaction can actually account for this change in, uh, in the beaming that we see, if we can actually now have enough clues to explain why this, this spinning top, this, this uh, rotating pulsar has disappeared. So here's a reconstruction of the crime scene. We have, two, uh, we have a double neutral star system. The, the, the one with the beams is the pulsar. 
Um, and you can see we'll, in blue we'll, uh, we'll draw out space-time again. And if I just assume that it's flat and the orbit still continues, then you can see that after one rotation, the rotation after one orbit, the rotational axis of the pulsar is unchanged. But of course now, you can see it's unchanged, but now we know what the mass of the companion is, so we're going to raise that and we're going to have space-time curve. We'll start out again with the same rotation axis. But then you can see that throughout one orbit, and this is exaggerated, the, uh, the, or the inclination axis, uh, sorry, the, the, the pulsar axis changes, and you can see that after one orbit, now they don't line up anymore. Again, this was exaggerated about one million times. The real effect is two degrees per year, which is very measurable. And how does this affect the pulsar profiles that I showed? Well, of course, initially the beams point towards Earth. So here is again the simulation. Top right is the year. We started in 1998. You can see that now the beam still hits Earth. Now you see the space-time of both sources, by the way. The beam still hits Earth, and then where once 2004 appears, the thinner of the two beams starts to miss us already, but then as we approach 2014, both are, uh, are out of view. And now even with Arecibo, the, the pulsar is all but gone. Now we're in the future. You can see that the beams continue to miss Earth more and more and more. So someone else might have, might just have, uh, some other planet might just have a pulsar appear in the sky, but from Earth we can't see it. So that, that's it. Case is closed. We found that, uh, that the geodetic precession can actually cause pulsars to disappear. It was a pretty, uh, pretty good test of GR. We had three independent tests. They all point, pinpointed at the same mass range, and that explained very well the change in, uh, in fingerprints that we saw. This is the first time that we saw a young pulsar like that disappear, and that's, uh, that's pretty exciting because these are the high-interest systems, the systems in which you can really see the effect on the orbit still of the very recent supernova, so we, we keep trying to find more of these. Um, but overall, I think we've shown clearly that, that these amazing GR labs, they, can, they appear to come and go. Um, but with that, I, uh, I want to close this file and I want to tell you all, please continue eating your veggies and doing your workouts because the procession continues and continues. So I hope to be here again and speak to you when the pulsar process is back into view, which will be in 2170. Thanks. <laughs>
Tidal disruption events, or TDEs, are thought to be rare occurrences wherein a supermassive black hole captures material from a star that has wandered too close. Assassin has discovered not one, but two such events, both the nearest Earth ever found in only the first 1.5 years of operation, indicating that these events might be more common than previously thought. The two largest ever discovered M-dwarf flares, which are outbursts thought to be caused by a star's incredibly large magnetic fields, also number among Assassin's discoveries, as do numerous outbursts of active galactic nuclei, stellar flares, and the most numerous of our own galactic transients, cataclysmic variable stars. Also known as CVs, these stars are close binaries, consisting of a white dwarf, and most often, a main sequence star much like our own sun. Material from the larger donor star is pulled in orbit around the white dwarf. When material from the disk reaches the surface of the white dwarf, thermonuclear reactions detonate in what can be seen as a classical or recurrent nova outburst. Other outbursts, known as dwarf novae, can also be detected and are caused by instabilities in the accretion disk. With R6 cameras, Assassin discovers on average 25 new CVs a month and detects roughly twice as many outbursts in that same time period. These CVs and their outbursts are often of great interest not only to professional astronomers, but to the large amateur astronomer community as well. For example, Assassin 14EI is a CV we discovered in late July of 2014. It currently has over 33,000 observations at the Astronomical Association of Variable Star Observers website. These observations are mainly produced by amateur astronomers, and the object continues to be intensely monitored as it is still active five months later. Other CVs, such as Assassin 13CK, Assassin 14CL, and Assassin 14DX, combined likewise also have thousands of observations at the AABSO. Due to the inherently fascinating astrophysics at work in these systems, the number of outbursts regularly found by Assassin in our data and the large community interest in CVs, we decided to launch as our first automated and real-time public data release, the Assassin CV Patrol. The website can be seen on top. The Assassin CV Patrol is a web tool which tracks CV observations in real time. If Assassin catches a CV that brightens by more than a certain amount, it's automatically flagged and sent to this website within the hour. This ensures that observers are able to follow up on interesting outbursts Assassin finds uh, as soon as possible. Users can also access all of the Assassin data for these objects, as can be seen here, for example, and will be able to receive email, uh, email alerts for objects of their choice. Assassin thus aims to release data in an organized and targeted, useful way to those interested in observations. The Assassin CV Patrol will form the basis of future data releases for other types of objects, such as bright active galactic nuclei, Bazars, quasars, and M-dwarf flares. Oops, I think I missed the summary. Ah, uh, yes. yes. I'm sorry. Okay. In summary, Assassin is a relatively easy to expand and affordable survey, and it is the only survey that monitors the entire sky. In doing so, it finds diverse populations of supernovae and numerous other exciting discoveries. From feeding supermassive black holes to active galactic nuclei to violent magnetic flares of dwarf stars and eruptions between binary companions, Assassin looks for one and all. As the first step in making all of our Assassin data public, we have recently released the Assassin CV Patrol, which serves a global CV community and which will be the basis for future releases. As we expand, we look forward to seeing what the universe still has in store. I would like to end by saying that it is the long-term goal of Assassin to release all data automatically and in real time. And in doing so, we will have, for the first time in human history, a movie of the entire night sky. On behalf of the Assassin team, thank you. Thank you very much to all four of our speakers. We will now go to the question and answers. Uh, again, please, when you uh, have a question, wait for the microphone to come to you and identify yourself by name and affiliation. Anyone on the web, please post your questions via text chat, and Rick Feinberg will then read it for you. Any questions? Here we go. Go for Schilling, freelance from the Netherlands. I have a question for George. With uh, a couple million uh, uh, quasars, how often do you expect to actually witness 
the merger of two supermassive black holes and what would we see from that? And I have also a question for Yuri. Uh, whether or not is this the first detection of geodetic precession and uh, how large would that effect be for, if you happen to know, for Mercury in our own solar system? To answer your first question, I don't know. And I'm not sure that theorists actually know with any degree of certainty. I mean, there are many models uh, of population of merging supermassive black holes. My guesstimate is that they will be relatively rare. Um, these are not events that LIGO or similar instruments can see because they operate in much higher frequencies of gravitational waves. But these will be things that the pulsar timing arrays can see very nicely. And in fact, I don't know the limits of the sensitivity, but it's entirely possible that pulsar timing arrays might be able to see long wavelength gravitational waves from some of these binaries. Thank you. We have Shall I? Oh, so sorry. In response to the second question, uh, um, it's not the first time a, a pulsar has disappeared through a geodetic, geodetic precession. We know of a, another double neutron star in which there's a much older pulsar. It's 50 million years old, and that has also, over the last few years, slowly disappeared. This is the first time we're seeing that even these very young sources that are very, that behave much more wildly in, in, in pulsar timing terms, that those two can disappear. Um, as to the, the, the precession of, uh, of Mercury, that's of course that was one of the, 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 the famous and important uh, tests of GR in the, in the early 20th century. There's a, so, so Mercury has a large precession that's mostly classical, just because of the, the pool of the other planets. But there was always an unexplained bit of about four, I think, 43 arc seconds per century. So four, remember the number, 43 arc seconds per century. And what we measure here is a geodetic precession of two and a half degrees per year. So I just divided the two, and so it's 20,000 times stronger. Isn't that the periodic astronomy precession? I'm talking about the change in spin axis. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, no, uh, yeah, I'll look that up. Okay. Uh, Bas ten Hond, Trouw and The Economist. A um, question for Yuri van Leeuwen as well. Um, <coughs> you mentioned that um, one of the beams disappeared earlier than the other, uh, sooner than the other one because it was thinner. Um, was it known that the two beams could be uh, different in thickness or in, in spread? And um, could you use the fact that you see it disappearing earlier and maybe you could measure the difference? Could you use that for anything to know more about the system? That's a very good point. Of course, with a lighthouse on Earth, we always live in the plane of the lighthouse. So if it has two beams, they'll always hit you. But if a pulsar lives in a 3D space, so usually you just see one of the poles. And this is a very special case already. It's called a, some, it's an orthogonal rotator where you can see both poles hit you. And just from the pulse profiles, from those fingerprints you see, there's one pulse peak, and then there's a dimmer one later. So from that, we already had a feel that this other beam was thinner, and then also it, it, it disappeared earlier. By then looking very closely at basically the angles of the light that comes in by the polarization, you can make very good maps. That's what we're doing now. It's not in this paper yet. You can make very good maps of what these emission regions are like. And from that, we hope to construct a, a, a much, much improved model of how these two beams interact in these cosmic lighthouses. Okay. Um, there's a question over here. Hi, Martin Reichler, Freelance, one for George and one for Daniel, if I may. Um, the, are you seeing any if evidence of gravitational wave uh, by uh, the period change in these two black holes that are so close together? Uh, I would expect to see that, right? And then for Daniel, um, the black hole is uh, your detection with new stars 100 times the brightness of A, but it's also the dustiest. Um, is the dustiness related to the luminosity, or is that kind of an intrinsic luminosity, of, and, and it's hidden by dust? Is, and is the hundred times what you observe, or the intrinsic brightness? Thanks. Um, well, there is no detection of gravitational waves, direct one, right. by anybody ever so far. The indirect from pulsar timing, right? Um, I expect that at some point something like pulsar timing array might be sensitive enough to see, maybe not this particular binary, but presumably there are some that are even closer 
and so that can well happen. I do a quick follow-up on is what kind of time would you expect to see a change in the period to like well, right now we just have an upper limit on the shrinking of the period with more data we can do that better. I mean, basically, that's where the estimate of time to merger comes from, uh, which at this point is at least 100,000 years. So for a four-year period, that means it's a very gradual change. Okay. Um, so the factor of 100 bright, the fa that B is 100 times brighter than A, that's the apparent brightness. But these high-energy X-rays are fairly penetrating, so we think that's likely the luminosity difference that there is the chance that A is so, so heavily obscured, um, it could be intrinsically comparable luminosity. There's a very, very large amount of material that seems less likely. Okay. Jay Pasikoff, textbook author. Could Dr. Danilet say a bit more about the cameras and telescopes, whatever is mapping the sky every day and what the magnitude limits are? Uh, how it, it will overlap with some of the surveys that we're otherwise hearing about um, and about the software that's used to tell what's an asteroid and what's a supernova and what's a cataclysmic variable. Thank you. We use cameras from Finger Lake Instrumentation. Uh, they are cooled CCD cameras uh, hosted by LCOGT at, um, in Hawaii and Chile. Uh, we have the four units in Hawaii and the two in Chile, although we are expanding. We see about down to 17th magnitude, so 25,000 times fainter than the best human eye can see. Um, and uh, in terms of survey footprint, we are the only survey to um, look at the close by sky. Um, we're very complementary in that way to the other large surveys such as LSST and IPTF. Um, um, the software that we use was developed by graduate student um, now postdoc uh, Ben Shapi, who is at uh, Carnegie, uh, Hubble and Carnegie Mellon Fellow, and Professor Chris Klachanik. And the, uh, we scan by eye for supernovae, whereas for CVs we have a catalog of um, objects at certain locations that we continuously monitor. And when um, we see a brightness with reference, um, a, brighter, a brightening compared to its reference image, we know that possibly something is going on. And so we take it to the active CD table on our website. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yep. Thanks. Uh, Dan Cleary from Science Magazine. Question for George or George Jorkowski. Um, are there any other possible explanations for this periodicity in the quasar source? We couldn't think of any. And I think the intuitive reason I gave you is that if you have something in the field of supermassive black hole, it's very difficult to perturb it, except with a comparable mass. Um, so there are these various technical mechanisms that have been proposed by theorists, and we don't know which of them, maybe multiple ones, are at play. As we continue to monitor the object, especially spectroscopically, we might be able to learn something more about that. But again, I think we'll probably learn more by monitoring the whole population of them. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? Any questions on the web? This first question comes from Camille Carlisle at Sky and Telescope. It's for uh, George Dragovsky. Uh, can you estimate how long ago the galaxy merger may have happened? That's her first question. And her uh, second question is, are the other 19 objects that you found, uh, are they likely also binary black holes? Uh, well, we don't have a good way of estimating time when that merger brought these two black holes to happen, but it was less than a giga year and probably more than 100 million years. Um, and yes, we believe that all the remaining ones uh, presumably can be explained in the same way. Uh, we just chose the best looking one to be the first thing to publish, but we're studying all the others and we're now following some other leads. Okay, and she also follows up with, um, are, are the separations of the other 19 also subparsec, or put another way, uh, what is the range of periods for their periodic variations? The range of periods is really given by the baseline of our, our survey. Um, so it's anywhere between a couple of years to um, 
four or five years, six years. Um, and that's just because that's what we can detect. Uh, range of separations, uh, I'm going to guess, will be probably similar. We don't know the separations except to make reasonable assumptions. What are the masses of these black holes? And if we use masses that are commonly estimated for black holes in quasars, that's where this estimate came from. Now, by playing with different parameters of the orbit and by masses of the black holes, that can be uh, moved in either direction, probably by at least a factor of 10. That's a perfect setup for the next question, which comes from Pete Spots at the Christian Science Monitor, also for Dr. Tchaikovsky. Um, what is the approximate distance to this uh, binary quasar or binary black hole? Um, and what are the masses or the combined masses of these black holes? The distance is about three and a half billion light years from the Earth. And the combined mass we're guessing, again, on the basis of other knowledge of quasars is of the order of some hundreds of millions of solar masses. Okay, and I have a question myself, Rick Feinberg, AAS press officer for uh, Bianca Danilet. Um, you described your survey as, uh, as the only one of its kind, but I'm wondering how it uh, complements or competes with the uh, AABSO's all -sky photo or photometric all-sky survey, which I think also uh, uses small telescopes, CCD cameras, and I believe is, is meant to cover both hemispheres. Tom, actually. Oh, Larry. Oh, Larry, 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 Larry give Tom a mic so he can answer. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Oh, there we go. Um, I would say. Just off the top of my head, I don't know all the parameters of the survey you mentioned, so I can't say for sure um, how exactly we compare. I'd be happy to like look at it and give you some, some more details uh, afterwards. Um, but I would say that just from our findings um, and the, the discoveries that we're making, we're finding a lot of things that just nobody seems to be looking for. Um, and with regards to other professional surveys and amateur surveys, uh, they are uh, either just not looking in the same regime that we're looking at or they're targeting their surveys a little bit more. Um, and because we're just sort of very unbiased and very uh, looking much at the bright end, um, we're finding a lot of things that nobody else is. So uh, just based on our discoveries, I would say that we're complementing pretty much everything else that's out there right now. And would that include the, uh, the large synoptic survey telescope when it comes online? Is it all going yeah. to look only at, at much fainter objects? Yeah, actually, um, we our depth limit is right about LSST saturation magnitude, um, so we complement them really well. <laughs> we like to think of ourselves as the SSST. Small synoptic <laughs> survey telescope. Yes, perhaps a less controversial name than Assassin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there are no more questions from the internet right now. Okay, any more questions in the room? If not, I would like to thank our speakers, George Chagovsky, Daniel Stern, Yuri Van Leuven, and Bianca Danilet. I have two more announcements. Anyone who was at the press dinner last night and has not paid Rick, please do so today. <laughs> and second, uh, the final press conference at this American Astronomical Society meeting will be this afternoon at 2.15, right here, about predictions and probabilities. Very mysterious. So I hope to see you all there. Thank you.